Great, thank you. Welcome, welcome everybody to NCJW Atlanta Section's rescheduled fall opening program. And though we are now online rather than a person at Maggiano's as we had planned, we nevertheless are thrilled to host the distinguished Congressman Nikema Williams and to present our highest award, the Hannah G. Sullivan Award to a very deserving community activist, Melita Easters. And though the Delta variant has kept us once again on screens, we've still managed to be out and about working to make a difference in our community. We took to the streets at the end of August to march for voting rights, and again two weeks ago to march for reproductive rights, health, and justice. As most of you know, resettling immigrants has been a significant part of our organization's history. And in continuing that work, that good work, we have created an Afghan resettlement committee to help the several hundred Afghan refugees arriving in Atlanta in the coming weeks and months. In order to be as knowledgeable and impactful as we can when we welcome these new refugees to our city, we have scheduled a cultural training session with the Islamic Speakers Bureau next Monday, October 25th at 1.30 so that we can be knowledgeable and impactful as we welcome these new refugees to our city. We hope to engage our members of all ages in this significant outreach. Please be sure to make your reservation for our upcoming program on the evening of November 9th. The program Roe v. Wade in Jeopardy will feature Andrea Young from the ACLU, Stacy Fox of Planned Parenthood, and our own Dr. Mimi Zeman. You can find information on these programs and initiatives in our weekly e-blast, so please make sure you're receiving yours and join us in the important advocacy work and community service of NCJW. And now I invite you all to sit back and watch this special video and award presentation. Lita, I first met you 34 years ago when we were in the same Leadership Atlanta study group. 34 years. I guess we were both teenagers. <laughs> Truth is, you were amazing way back then. Hannah Greenbaum Solomon would be delighted to know that you are the recipient of the award bearing her name. In 1893, she was appointed to the Women's Committee for the World's Parliament of Religions, held in connection with the Chicago World's Fair. Although discouraged by the Jewish men of the day from taking an active role, she strongly believed that Jewish women throughout the country should be at the event. So she invited them herself. She arranged a Jewish Women's Congress out of which the National Council of Jewish Women was born and Solomon served as its first president. The Hannah G. Solomon Award is presented to an individual who has helped to change and expand the role of others in vital areas of community life and motivated others, which you have done, to fight for change both of which have in turn resulted in progress and enlightenment in the community. NCJW's values today mirror her values then. Children and women's rights, immigration, public health, and safeguarding individual rights and freedoms. We know these are your values as well. There could not be a more deserving recipient of our Hannah G. Solomon Award than Melita Easters because you share three of Hannah's important characteristics. A devotion to rooting out and attacking inequality, fierce determination, and starting movements. Melita's background as a reporter trained at UGA's School of Journalism, gave her the ability to honestly assess and ethically confront issues affecting women and children. She developed the concept and co-chaired the first YWCA Salute for Women of Achievement in 1997 and 1998, and developed the concept and chaired the first two Numbers Too Big to Ignore Luncheons for the Atlanta Women's Foundation, events which have raised millions for, the or for organizations that have improved the lives 
of families in Metro Atlanta, particularly women and children. As the founding chair in 1999 of George's Win List, Win standing for Women in Numbers, and its executive director since 2015, Melita's leadership has led to increasing the number of women in our General Assembly from 44 to 78. While WIN's focus is supporting pro-choice Democratic women candidates, it is safe to say that its effect has been nonpartisan and that Republicans have had to respond to the lack of women in their caucus in the legislature. Through Melita's efforts and those of her donors and endorsed candidates, Georgia has moved from 32nd in the nation for the percent of women legislators to 18th. Because of these accomplishments and many more, and there's a link to her complete bio in the chat, on behalf of NCJW Atlanta, Ronnie and I are so honored to present to you Melita Easter's and CJW's highest honor, the Hannah G. Solomon Award. Thank you, thank you so much to both of you for making the time to present this in person and to your organization and its board for this very high honor named for your remarkable founder. I am also grateful to the Georgia Win List Board and our donors and the wonderful 45 Win List endorsed women. It's great to know that your keynote speaker today is Nakima Williams, a graduate of our 2010 Win Leadership Academy program and an endorsed state senator before she was elected to Congress and became the president of her congressional freshman class. My last thank you is to two very special women who set a high bar for all of us for leadership and public service and have played a special role in my life. Elaine Alexander and Judith Taylor have opened many doors for me after the late Timmy Silver invited me to a YWCA committee meeting four decades ago. The two of them worked with me to establish both of those events for the YWCA and the Atlanta Women's Foundation. They were founding um, supporters for Georgia Win List and they support many of our elected women candidates. I hope all of us will mentor other young women in their, in their honor. Having read Hannah G. Solomon's autobiography, I am particularly humbled to receive an award named for a leader whose vision continues in the wonderful work of the NCJW and its international affiliates. This sculpture will sit in my office as a constant reminder of how much work remains and how far women have come since Ms. Solomon served as Susan B. Anthony's German and French interpreter when the 1893 International Council of Women met in Berlin. Certainly we women vote these days, but the work Hannah G. Solomon and her contemporaries started more than 125 years ago is far from complete. Our generation now joins generations of women before us who have marched and demonstrated to protect and defend our rights. Women are underrepresented in legislative bodies and corporate boards. We are paid less in the workplace and face the obstacles of discrimination, misogyny, and far too often gender violence. Some male legislators not only wish to suppress our votes, but now they still seek to control our personal medical decisions and deny reproductive freedom, including access to safe and legal abortion. Electing more women at all levels of government moves us closer to righting these wrongs and making our state and nation a better place for women, children, and families. Women more often decide to seek office based on their hope for making the world a better place. Once elected, women craft compassionate, family-friendly policies and support stronger social services safety nets. Our daughters and granddaughters deserve a society where nothing stands in the way of what they might achieve. Energized by the receipt of this award, I look forward to continuing to work with so many of you as we move the arc of the moral universe even further towards justice, 
equality, and better representation for all women. Thank you so very much. Go, Elaine. Oh, okay. As Hi, everybody. As Melita mentioned, Nakima was elected president of her freshman class in Congress. And until Elaine? that moment, I had lost faith in Congress. That restored some faith. And Nakima is still working on the faith of, that we all should have in the Congress of the United States. She serves on the Financial Services Committee, the Transportation and In Infrastructure Committee, and the Select Committee on, you should pardon the expression, the modernization of Congress. She also belongs to every caucus in Congress that we would all belong to if we were members. I am so proud of Nakima being one of the first members of the Black Jewish Caucus. But before she was elected to Congress, she served as the state representative of Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood used to be Planned Parenthood of Atlanta, then it was Metro Atlanta, then it was Georgia. And then the word came from on high, we had to absorb two other states. I was hoping for California and New York, that didn't happen. We got Mississippi and Alabama. But fortunately, we had Nakima Williams to send into Mississippi and Alabama. And at that time, she fought for the voting rights. She fought for the quality of women. She pounded the pavements of Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia to make sure that no big anti-choice legislation reached the floor of any of those houses. That's when I first met her. And I knew we had a dynamo and I first became not only a fan of Nakeem Williams, but a devoted surrogate mother. Um, everybody knows I have four children, four children-in-law, but what you don't know is I have a small group of children in love. And Nakeem is one of those children. And that's why she calls me Granny Elaine, because that's what I am to Carter. While Nakima was the head of public policy at PPSE, she worked so hard to make sure that the women in each of the three states were well represented in their house, and she was very successful. She was born in Columbus, Georgia, raised by her beloved grandparents, across the state line in Alabama. She has, as anyone can expect, many honors and recognitions. But the one closest to her heart is the one she proudly shares with her husband, Leslie Small, and their precious, precocious son, Carter. I have known and loved Nakima Williams since her early days at Planned Parenthood. And every day, I am more and more proud of her. Nikima, would you like to say a few words before I begin asking you the questions that I have ready? Absolutely. I've never been short on words, Granny Elaine. So <laughs> well, I would Charlie love needs to, to share <laughs> a few words with everyone. 
first, um, good afternoon, everyone. I know we went through a few scheduling hiccups to get this done, but just going through the Zoom pages, I am so honored to see so many people here today that have played such a critical role in me becoming a member of Congress. I see Judith Taylor down at the bottom, who we all know without your family's leadership and the work that you continue to do, Planned Parenthood wouldn't exist here and you guys wouldn't have become my family. And I mean, I remember the early days of me after Carter was born and Granny Elaine would come over and just hold Carter so that I could get some rest because y'all it is rough with the newborn and still trying to pull it all together. And Sherry, so many things that we've been through and just your leadership with this organization. I am so honored to be here with you all today. Um, I wanna thank everyone, especially Melita Easters, the work that you've done with Georgia Winless, continuing to change the face of Georgia politics one woman at a time. And so I continue to support Winless. I encourage you all to support Winless because y'all, it truly makes a difference to have more women in elective office. So I was asked to talk just a little bit about Congress. And y'all, if you would have, if you would ask me to describe my first 10 months, because I'm still in awe that it's only been 10 months, so much has, has happened. I quite frankly, probably couldn't do it. This past year has been so much at times frustrating and sometimes y'all downright scary. I told people that on my first Wednesday in Congress, we had a domestic terrorist attack at the Capitol only three days in, three days after my swearing in. And then the following Wednesday, I voted to impeach our former president. And then the third Wednesday, I went to a historic inauguration where we swore in Joe Biden and the first female vice president of this country. So then on the fourth Wednesday, my husband Leslie told me, Nakima, I need your the highlight of your day to be that you went and got a bagel from the Longworth cafeteria because <laughs> every Wednesday had been so eventful. But y'all through it all and all of the eventful Wednesdays that followed, I've experienced hope, inspiration, and a lot of fun along the way because you gotta have fun while you're doing this. And I have the honor of serving with Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and she always reminds us to focus on our why. Because when we focus on our why, you'll never be deterred, and you'll never have to wonder if it's worth it. Focusing on my why, centering the needs of those most marginalized, and the people and the communities that I serve keeps me grounded and working through the noise in Washington to, del to deliver for the people of the fighting fifth. The challenges are worth it when I think about how we as Democrats in Congress have already made progress for the people. The pandemic quickly exposed how deeply people were hurting and we answered the call with the American Rescue Plan. The American Rescue Plan changed the lives of millions of people across the country with stimulus payments that helped put food on the table and eased hardships. And y'all, the American Rescue Plan included $206 million in direct funding for Fulton County and another $170 million for the city of Atlanta. And then just last Friday, something that is really important to me, the fourth payments of the expanded child tax credit hit families' bank accounts. These payments have cut child poverty in half, y'all. And this means a lot to me because as Elaine told you, I was raised by my grandparents in Smith Station, Alabama, the big city. I grew up on a farm, y'all, and I grew up in poverty. And so I understand what it means to need just a little bit of help to make everything work out. And so I am proud of the work that we've done in Congress to cut childhood poverty in half. And I also understand that although we didn't have much growing up, we always had a place to call home. And that's why I am so keen on the work that we're doing right now in President Biden's Build Back Better plan to make sure that we can truly build back better to give people things that they need to not just merely survive, but to thrive. So in the next few weeks, you're gonna be hearing a lot about infrastructure. You're gonna hear a lot about the Build Back Better plan. What does that mean? What's included? And I hope that we'll get to talk more about that today. But keep in mind, when we talk about building back better, we're talking about extending the child tax credit because when you cut childhood poverty in half, you can't go back and say, okay, now these children should be hungry again. 
when you talk about universal pre-K, so that in a state like Georgia, where we're more fortunate than most, but pre-K is still a lottery system, you literally have to register your child in a lottery to see if they're going to get a head start in life. I'll never forget one of my friends was pregnant with her second child, and she slept outside on the in front of the church in front of the state capitol in Georgia to try to get her four-year-old in pre-k the next year y'all we're better than that and we can and will do better with President Biden's Build Back Better Act we're going to provide paid family leave and medical leave so that we can catch up with the rest of the world so that women can take care of their bodies and their babies after they're born. And then you can also have time to be with your aging parents or family members if they should need you in their golden moments of life. We're gonna finally make the wealthy corporations pay their fair share in taxes because y'all, all of this is paid for. President Biden has done the work to make sure that we can get this done. And now we just have to have the political will in Congress and I'm with him 100% of the way. I can't wait to make sure that we continue to push affordable housing. I remember um, just two weeks ago, I had the Secretary of Housing in our district, Secretary Marsha Fudge, and we were able to go and meet with two residents in Atlanta, Ms. Juanita Wallace and Labonia Morgan. Ms. Wallace and Morgan welcomed us into their homes and shared just how lucky they were to have affordable housing within walking distance of a MARTA station and the brand new Peace Park that has a statue of Congressman John Lewis to ground us in our why and why we continue to do this work. And y'all, this is in Herndon Square, right on Northside Drive in Atlanta. You can look over one side and see the new Mercedes-Benz Stadium and look on and see the MARTA station across the street. Everyone should have access to smart, desirable housing developments like Herndon Square. We need more affordable housing in desirable locations where residents can easily access transportation to get to work, to get to school, and to get to those things that we all have come to love to do in our great city. Where families are happy and know that their children have safe places to play, housing is a human right, and I'll never waver from my commitment to secure the resources that we need to ensure desirable housing is available to everyone, no matter their zip code. We also have to think about building back better, some things that have, that have been done by our government, sometimes intentionally in the past. When we think about the 1956 Federal Highway Act that displaced families and destroyed communities, predominantly black communities, the economic devastation left behind still persists to this day. And in the fifth district, you can see that no more clearly than the Sweet Auburn district and the Summer Hill communities that were divided intentionally by the construction of the downtown connector and Interstate I-20. And so I've worked with President Biden to create the Reconnecting Neighborhoods program that will invest in the redesign or removal of highway infrastructure built through communities of color. Right now, this act has $4 billion to restore communities, and I'm still pushing for more, so stay tuned for more information. And y'all, we're also tackling another matter of racial justice in Congress this fall, reproductive justice. This is the first time that we've had a majority pro-choice Congress, the first time ever. And so we had to make sure that we met the moment and we passed the Women's Health Protection Act so that we can finally, once and for all, codify Roe versus Wade, so that it doesn't matter what the courts decide on one day or another, but we can make sure that no matter where you live in this country, that we have reproductive rights for everyone. Every woman should have access to abortion care and reproductive health care without restriction. But y'all, all of these priorities, delivering historic economic relief, closing the racial wealth gap, delivering on the promise of affordable housing, protecting reproductive rights, and so much more are at risk if we don't protect the sacred and fundamental right to vote. Everything that we care about and are fighting for is connected to protecting our right to vote and doing so now. Time is running out. Our democracy is at stake and each of us has a role to play in saving it. In the 2020 elections, 
Georgia kind of shocked the nation when we delivered not one, but two Democratic senators to Washington, Senator John Ossoff and Senator Reverend Raphael Warnock. And what do we see in return? According to an analysis from the Brennan Center, state legislatures in over 40 states across the country introduced legislation designed to make it harder for people to vote. And that includes Georgia's own Jim Crow 2.0 SB 202. But let's be clear, these assaults are designed to silence the voice of people of color, people who look like me. So we might not be counting jelly beans in a jar, in a jar anymore, but they're seeking the same results. The House has done our job. We passed HR 1, the For the People Act, and HR 4, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act which was so aptly named to honor my predecessor, my mentor, and all of our friend, Congressman John Lewis. The reforms in these bills meet the moment and address the threats to our democracy that attempt to suppress the voices of the communities who most desperately need to be heard. So now we're looking to the Senate y'all and I'm gonna need your help with this. I need you to keep calling our senators, making sure that they understand how critical this is for you and how important this is to every other issue that you care about. If you care about climate change, then you care about voting rights. If you care about reproductive rights, then you care about voting rights. If you care about racial inequality, then you care about voting rights. So we need to do what we know we always do here in Atlanta, make sure that our voices are heard, reach out to members of the United States Senate, and let's show them exactly what John Lewis would aptly call good trouble. So I'm grateful to be here with you today because y'all are co-conspirators for justice. I know that I can always count on you to be in this fight with me, and I'm not doing it alone. So thank you to the National Council of Jewish Women for fighting alongside me every step of the way. And I'm going to turn it back over to Granny Elaine for some Q&A for anything that I didn't cover or to answer any questions that you might have. Well, I, you're wonderful, Nakeem. You really are. You have answered almost all of the prepared questions that I have to ask you. But I have a personal question. What is the difference between the House and the Senate bill regarding the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill? What is the difference between the two and how do you perceive the movement on the bill? So, well, we, we sent them a very robust package to um, for, with HR 1, the For the People Act. So the House has sent over two bills, HR 1, the For the People Act, which includes a number of democracy reforms. And we all know that we have a little friend in the United States Senate named Joe Manchin, who was like, no, we can't just let you have everything that you want. And so there's this new bill, the Freedom to Vote Act, that has been sponsored by our Senator, Raphael Warnock. He's helped to lead this charge. But Joe Manchin actually wrote this bill with us. And so this bill, while it is not everything that we would want, it includes things like standardizing access to mail-in ballots. And we know that is one of the huge hurdles that we have here in Georgia with this new law where they're trying to restrict the way people access mail-in ballots. So, and it also includes things like automatic voter registration. Um, we have gone back and forth on trying to continue to expand what the Freedom to Vote Act looks like, but this is a step in the right direction to securing our democracy. I wholeheartedly support it. It's never going to make me stop trying to work to expand access to the ballot even more because I feel that when you go in a McDonald's, no matter what state you're in, you know that if you order the six piece chicken nugget meal, you're going to get French fries, you're going to get a soda, you're going to get six chicken nuggets in your choice of sauce. But when we, and we have that for restaurants and for clothing stores, but we don't have a standardized process in how we access voting across the country. So we need to get what the basics are. Once we get the basics and we can continue to add on to make sure that people have access that is much broader, we shouldn't always be making it easier for people to access the ballot, not harder. And that's what the Freedom to Vote Act will do. Thank you. Based on the makeup of the Supreme Court, do you perceive any way that Congress 
can act to protect a woman's right to choose? So I am fearful of the makeup of the Supreme Court and what will come of the Mississippi decision that is going before the court. So we should have a decision in um, June of what will happen there, which is why I think it is critically important that we continue to push forward with the Women's Health Protection Act that will codify Roe versus Wade. When we passed this bill just last month, I was stunned to learn that this is the first time ever that we've had a majority pro-choice Congress. I, it never dawned on me that even when Democrats were in control before, we didn't have a majority of pro-choice members. Y'all, there was only one Democrat in Congress that didn't vote for this. And of course, y'all know that that didn't sit well with me. And so I was giving him side eye and trying to figure out like, well, who's going to be running against him in the primary? Because if I can't count on you to stand with the women of this country, then we probably need someone who is going to stand up for the people that they represent. And so we're we're going to continue to work on that. I'll tell y'all who he is offline so that we can work on getting um, a good pro-choice woman elected in that seat. But we, we've already passed this in the House and it's over in the Senate. And along with so many of the other good pieces of legislation that we've passed in the House, the filibuster continues to stand in the way of us getting work done on behalf of the people of this country. So I'm concerned that if we don't do something that protects um, that or codifies Roe v. Wade, that the Supreme Court decision, I know that I see we have Andrea Young on with the ACLU and she can probably tell you like the legal um, ramifications of this better than I can, but I'm, I'm really concerned. And so we've got to get this done in the Senate to pass the Women's Health Protection Act. And I know that the Department of Justice has now stepped in to see, um, to make sure that in the meantime, as bills go through the court system, that we can have in, in, um, these bills enjoined so that we can continue to have access for women. But I don't know what happens after June if we don't codify Roe versus Wade in the United States Congress. Is there anything that we can do to make that happen? So one of the things that we've been con continuing to talk about with, um, with the White House and with the leadership in the Senate is how there should be certain constitutional rights that should be filibuster proof. So not saying get rid of the filibuster, which I would be all for, but not saying get rid of it completely, but meeting people where they are and saying that when it comes down to certain rights in this country, constitutional rights, that there should be, they should be beyond a filibuster vote. And so that is something that we've been talking with the White House about. We've been talking with Senator Manchin. He, we all know that he came back a couple of weeks ago and wanted to insert the Hyde Amendment into, um, into part of his bargaining chip to get this done. And so right now we're in a posture where President Biden initially, when he was running for president, he was of the same mindset of Joe Manchin. And I'll never forget, there was a Democratic committee meeting in town and a New York Times reporter came up to me. This was in 2018. And they asked me about the filibuster. I mean, they asked me about the Hyde Amendment and the remarks that President Biden said. And y'all, I always have to stand up for what I believe in. And I said, I think the vice president is wrong. And when we talk about access, it shouldn't depend on your bank account if you have access to reproductive health care. And so while I disagree with the vice president, I'm happy to have a conversation with him to bring him along to understand that when we talk about access, we want access for everyone. And I don't know if he read my New York Times interview in between noon that day and that evening when he stepped on stage at the event in Atlanta, but y'all, he had done a complete turnaround and decided that he no longer supported the Hyde Amendment and that, yes, access means access for everyone in this country. And we have to continue to push that because I think that when people talk about taxpayer funding for abortion, they get lost in the conversation of who that means will not have access because women of means will always have opportunities that other women don't. And so when we talk about, when I talk about the policies that I support and centering those most marginalized, I can't leave women behind who don't have the same access and opportunities that those of us on this Zoom today have. Thank you, thank you. Can we return now to our thoughts 
I mean, I've just got, I've got to say something personal in here. There was a wonderful Yiddish word, it's kvel. And that means to bask in the glory of someone you love. I am kvelling. Thank you, Nakima. I have one question. Let's bring us back to Georgia for just a moment. What do you see happening with the redistricting in this state? Redistricting. Um, the special election of the Georgia General Assembly starts the first week of November, and they will be in for approximately three weeks to determine our state legislative lines, our congressional lines for the next 10 years, y'all. And this is, um, we're playing for all the marbles here. And of course, Republicans in the Senate released one map where they want to make Lucy Mc Congresswoman Lucy McMath's district um, basically a safe Republican seat. And what we saw in the November 2020 elections and in the January Senate runoffs is that Georgia is a 50-50 state and we have 14 congressional seats and we should at least have an opportunity to compete in seven congressional districts. I'm not saying that we should draw seven Democratic seats and seven or seven Republican seats, but we should have the opportunity to be competitive in these seats. And you'll hear a lot of members talking about what it means for Black members of Congress to have their BVAP, the Black voting age population decreased. And it historically has not been something that a lot of our Black members have wanted to do, which is decrease the Black number of voters in their district. But y'all, I've told people over and over that I will share the wealth because I feel like I can be competitive and white people will vote for me. I'm all about building multiracial coalitions and making sure that we can, we can elect members of our choice and to represent us in Washington and at the state capitol. And so we are looking at what that means across the country because what Republicans are now doing are trying to pack black voters into a certain number of districts so that they can not, so that they're not competitive in other seats. And so we need to make sure that we are being forward thinking and looking at the big picture in all of this. Right now we have the ability to have a Democratic Speaker of the House and pass all of this legislation that I've been talking about. But if we look at the maps, we only have a three vote margin in Congress for Democrats, three. And if we look at the maps that in states like Texas and in states like Georgia that they're trying to draw, they're trying to draw us out of the majority, not compete on values or not compete on policy ideas, but draw us by, based on gerrymandering, draw us out of the majority. And that's just not okay, especially in a state like Georgia, when we've proven in not one election cycle, but one presidential election and two U.S. Senate races that we're a 50-50 state. And so we need the opportunity to be competitive. We're going to, you will see a map that is introduced by the congressional delegation this week, where it's not the map that any of us would have chosen if we were to cherry pick our voters, but that's not the way redistricting works. We should have voters picking their elected officials, not the other way around. And that's the map that you'll see come out that is supported by all six of the Democratic members of Congress, and it allows us to be competitive and, and see our state possibly to 7-7 seven, seven in our congressional delegation. Oh, Nakima, thank you, thank you, thank you for your information, your kindness, your ability to address issues. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Stacy, who is going to go into what people in the know call the chat room and give you questions from other people. But thank you so much for being with us. Okay, Stacey. Thank you, thank you, Elaine. Thank you, and thank you, Congressman Williams. Um, it was a lot of information to, to swallow and <laughs> I, I have so much to digest, but uh, it's terrific. Thank you for, for working on behalf of all of us. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, what is your attitude about the members of the squad voting against funding for the Iron Dome? So I, when I walk onto the floor, I am responsible for my vote. And I would say my vote alone, but I am freshman class president. And so I do have the, um, the honor of 
pulling my classmates together to make sure that they are doing the right thing to support our democratic values on the floor. When it comes to the Iron Dome funding, this was done as a ploy in the beginning. I voted for the Iron Dome funding because Israel has a right to defend themselves and we need to stand beside our allies. But when it comes to the Iron Dome funding, this was stripped out of the bill for a separate vote. And it was a setup to, so that people could see it was a political ploy in the beginning. We knew we had the votes to pass it. And so separating it out was to try and get people on the record of where they were and to, and even some Republicans supported separating it out so that there could be a standalone vote for them to come at Democrats and say that we were not supportive of Israel. And so there are a lot of things. I sit here and I watch a lot of the, the games that are played with people's lives and with real policy. And this was one of those times where this should have been a part of the overall defense bill, but it was separated out as a separate vote and we still passed it because that's what the majority of the members of the House of Representatives support in Israel, one of our, our greatest allies, especially in that region, the only democracy having a right to defend themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. I wanted to follow up a little bit on the redistricting uh, issue you were talking about and the new map that's going to be introduced this week, as you said. Um, if, if you have such hard line opposition to it from, the, uh, from other members of uh, Congress, especially from Georgia, how, what, are the, what are the opportunities of it ever being accepted? For it, redistricting? For redistricting, so, and what what about the possibility of doing a, a nationwide a, a standard for redistricting? So, if I had it my way, Stacy, we would have a nationwide standard. We would have nonpartisan redistricting commissions. That is what was included in HR one that we were pushing for, but we're not quite there yet in getting it. Um, passed through the U.S. Senate, and so it's still sitting there, and so we can continue to voice and elevate our concerns over that, but time is running out as states um, continue to draw lines right now in real time, and we're seeing um, lines being introduced. So um, what we're looking at in Georgia is how do we make sure that whatever we, we are presenting is something that also is a litigation map because we do, we understand that Republicans are gonna pass what they wanna pass when it comes to the legislature, but we have to stand on the side of what is fair, just and right. And so that's why we're introducing a map that is fair, a fair map, not saying we could have drawn a 10, for democratic seat and like made it all gerrymandered, but that's not a fair map. That's a That would be great for Democrats, but it wouldn't be fair. And so we're looking at our map being something that we can take to court and say, we gave them an opportunity to pass something that was fair and yet they chose to do something different. So right now we are not only looking at, we know that they're not gonna accept our maps, but we know that this won't be the final say in these maps and we're looking forward to seeing them in courts. Sometimes if we can't beat them in the legislature, we gotta see them in court. Agreed, thank you. Um, here's a question from um, your friend, Judith Taylor. Um, what do you think about holding back on the infrastructure bill until President Biden's whole package is passed isn't some better than nothing? So historically, I would say something is better than nothing. And I had my first opportunity to have a president come into our Democratic caucus meeting just two weeks ago. President Biden came in and he talked about the things that he ran on. And he talked about the things that um, that our frontliners got elected on. He talked about things like child care. And I see a question in the chat about women choosing to stay home and not going back to work. Child care is still a challenge. My son's daycare center closed down in March of 2020 and y'all, they didn't reopen. And so all of the children who were in daycare at the federal building with Carter, I don't know where they just where their parents are now because daycare was finding a good quality child care was already at a premium. And so with that being said, the president has asked us to make sure that we get his agenda passed, which is a part of the entire package. Right now where we are is 
I'm of the mindset is that nobody should be holding out to get everything that they want, Judith. Right now, we had a 10-year package in the Build Back Better agenda. And so to get the numbers down to where Senator Manchin was comfortable and other members of the Senate, well, what if we just do the same policies, but implement them for five years and see, we, see where we are in five years? That cuts that $3.5 trillion number in half and gets us to a number that 90% of our caucus can agree on. And so that's where we are now trying to figure out which programs are we're going to cut um, in half to bring that number down. So the final number won't be 3.5 tr trillion, and we'll get the number down to something that everybody can agree on. But then we'll still, we won't have to decide what's more important to us, child care or pre-K. We won't have to decide what's more important to us, child care or paid family leave. We can get these things, but at a, um, in, half the number of years so that it costs half the amount. Great, thank you. Are new members of Congress assigned a mentor representative? And if so, did you get one? We are not assigned a mentor representative, but if y'all know me, you know that I didn't um, use that as something that I was just gonna go by. And so I've kind of adopted members along the way. And so I have, a. I remember early on, one of the first people that reached out to me to help me find somewhere to stay is Lois Frankel down in Florida. And Lois, um, she lives in this building where about 30 members of Congress live and we call it the dorm. And so Lois helped me find somewhere to live. And so she's been like my mama in Congress to make sure that I know like where to go and when to go. And so she's been very, very helpful. And then um, Marsha Fudge, who left me to go to be the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, she um, she saw something that I posted on social media that I love cabbage and I can't cook y'all like that is I've been blessed with many talents, but cooking is not one of them. And so she saw that I love cabbage and I said, nobody can make cabbage like my mama used to make it. And so Secretary Fudge um, has now become my soul food whisperer in Congress, even a secretary. And so I know where I can get a good home cooked meal. And also um, Reverend Emmanuel Cleaver, he's a United Methodist pastor out of um, Kansas City, Missouri, who kind of took me under his wing and has been very helpful. He grew up in the SNCC movement and um, SCLC and was really close to a lot of our leaders, civil rights leaders here from Georgia. And so he has kind of taken me under his wing to make sure that I understand the ins and outs and we serve on the House Financial Services Committee together, but it's been really, really helpful to have some of these leaders in Congress that have been here for years. And I can't say enough how helpful Speaker Nancy Pelosi has been. Early on, before my election was, uh, before I was sworn in, I got a phone call and y'all, I thought I was in trouble. I was like, why is the speaker calling me? I've been on TV. Um, I can get a little sassy sometimes when I'm talking about the things that I believe in. What did I say? What did I do? And Speaker Pelosi was calling me because she wanted me to nominate her um, when she was running for re-election for speaker. And so before I was even sworn into the caucus, Speaker Nancy Pelosi reached out to me and asked me if I would speak on her behalf at the caucus meeting for her re-election. And then um, after that, like she's just opened so many doors, opportunity after opportunity. And some of you were with me when she came to Atlanta to host a fundraiser for me. And it was the very first in-person event that she had done for a member um, in the country. And so I felt really special that as a little old freshman that I was able to have the speaker here in my district speaking on my behalf and supporting me and my reelection. That's fabulous. You, you obviously have been taken under some very wonderful wings. Um, we have, probably have time for uh, one more question. Here's one. Uh, what are the most pressing issues currently being addressed by the Black Jewish Caucus? So I think right now, um, I was looking at that because it's one of those caucuses where we're going to have to put some fire under their feet because we haven't been really active. And so we have a lot of members who um, I think sign up for caucuses because it looks good on paper, y'all, but I am a doer and I am ready to get to work. And so as I hear about 
so many of the misconceptions that people have about what it means to support Israel, I think that's where the Black Jewish Caucus can come into play. I think we can talk more about the parallels of the plight of the Jewish community and how, and I know that I might see it sort of differently because I'm from the South. And so I fully understand like the civil rights movement and what the connection is in the Black Jewish community than most people do. And so I see that as my role and how do I bring more people along the same framework to understand that we're all in this together because especially when we see things like the Iron, the Iron Dome funding being separated out for a separate vote, or when we see things when people want to talk about, um, like there's, there's a lot of misconceptions of what it means to support Israel. And I think that our caucus could provide the leadership in making sure that we're being vocal and speaking up about what that looks like to bring more people along so that they truly understand what's at stake here. Terrific, thank you. Um, I don't, we don't have any more questions coming through chat, so I think we've almost run out of our time anyway. So I want to thank you, Congressman Williams, so very much for your time and for all of your efforts on behalf of all of us, and absolutely keep up that sass. Um, I'm going to now pass it over to uh, my co-president, Sherry Frank, with some closing remarks. Sherry? Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, Congresswoman Nikima, I just can't wait until we can actually see you in person and applaud and, and hug you, but just thank you so much. You continue to be a righteous voice for our priorities in NCJW, which is protecting women, children, and families and being safeguards for individual rights and freedoms. And you really, really, really amplify that in all of your work. I want to tell Stacy what a joy it is to be a co-president with you, to thank Kathy Jacobson, our fabulous vice president for making sure that we crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's for today and uh, look forward to seeing you on uh, screen at future programs. Thank you, Kathy. And a word to Elaine, uh, really a trailblazer for women's rights on every board in the city and her voice and her wisdom is constantly sought. And Elaine, we love you. We thank you. We felt that you are still in our midst and giving us guidance and participating as we fell for our fabulous Congresswoman. Just a couple of uh, last uh, uh, remembrances. Please be sure that you register for our Roe v. Wade and Jeopardy program on November 9th. And throughout NCJW's history, we have always welcomed the stranger, have cared about the immigrant. And we are very excited about playing an active role, partnering with New American Pathways and the Islamic Speakers Bureau on being advocates and really um, impactful in our work with Afghan resettlement. So be sure y'all, if you are not getting our e-blast or you wanna find a way to get more involved, send a link to Christine H at ncjwatlanta.org so we can make sure that you are getting all of our information and participating at the level you're most comfortable with. So be safe, be vaccinated, be voting. We're now early voting is in place and thank you everyone for a wonderful hour and just keep up the great work, Congresswoman Nikema Williams. Goodbye.